for a play and like see what happened. Do we really know what happened? We're both into like true crimes. That's gonna be our theme song. Just it'll be just a that. silent recording of me going, Ooh, and it'll be flat and out of tune every time. That's good. This is mystery murder. Murdery, murdery, Hey y'all. What's up? <laughs> why did you just <laughs> tell me why you decided to enter our podcast with a um what's up? Because that's how I greet people. Isn't that how everyone talks? No. Ever since Scary Movie came out? No. I know oh, I have. Oh, yeah. What's that? What's that? What's that? That was, I remember, <laughs> I remember that part. That movie was not good. Scary Movie 3? No, just Scary Movie. Scary Movie 3 was the best one. I did not get that far. Well. In the Scary Movie franchise <laughs> tree. Well, we're going to watch it. We're okay. going to watch it. Great. Because Anna Ferris is in it. Anna Ferris? Ah! <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay. So, what are we talking about today? What episode is this? Four? This is episode four of Mystery Murdery Thingy. Welcome. I'm Mario. My name is Chloe. And basically, we talk about things that are unsolved. Mysterious. Mysterious. Ooh. It could be mysterious phenomena, maybe murders, right. legends. Weird sounds. Just weird stuff. The weirdest. Weird stuff that's going around. We're on iTunes. And we are on iTunes. Please subscribe. Ooh. Please rate. That'd be so cool. And leave us a note. Leave us a note. Let us know if you think we're doing great. If you think we're doing bad. <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> you're allowed You're allowed to express your opinion in any America. Opi- any opinion that you can you do. You can say whatever you want. That's what we love about America. And s- just make sure it's constructive. We don't give a shit. I That's don't what I love about America. Give a... I don't fuck with you. So, last Little time... Little stupid ass bitch, I okay. fuck with okay. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> settle, settle down there, boy. So last time I made a couple of uh, pretty big blunders. Oh <laughs> so yes, what did I, just, do I, wanted to, I wanted to do corrections at the beginning. So um, Joseph Smith is the founder of Mormonism or Jesus Christ, it's Latter Day Saints, whatever. Not John Smith. Joseph but, Smith, I, American Moses. Right. So I kept saying John Smith, which is not correct. Uh, I also kept saying that uh, Melanesia, etc., were um, west of Australia, which is the opposite of correct. <laughs> they are definitely east of Australia. So, in case you were wondering about that stuff. Okay, that was my corrections. And Chloe was perfect, as far as we can remember. <laughs> so, let us know. We're just going to leave it at that. Yes, Chloe's always perfect. Stop. Yes. Um, so who should go first this week? I'm talking about North Korean ghost ships. Okay, kind so... Kind of creepy, but not murdery. So that's a mystery thingy. Yeah, mystery thingy. I'm also doing a mystery thingy. Okay. Well, I'll just go first. do 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 We're doing a that? face-off? I don't know. Okay. Oh, okay. I you go know, first. I have no idea what you're doing. You have, should we do rock, paper, scissors? No. I'll, no, you go I'll first. Just, I'll just go first. Okay. So, tell us what you're talking about again. I am talking about North Korean ghost ships. So, wow. for at least since 2011, because that's as far back as the Japanese... Wait, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. But I just want to talk about how my boss, back when I worked at the restaurant, uh-huh. one time he tried to like convinced me that North Korea had submarines off the coast of Florida and off the coast of California. And he was like really serious. Wow. (laughs) So he was kind of a conspiracy theorist. (laughs) (laughs) I was just like nodding and smiling. Yes. And I was like, Oh, I just, (sighs) of course they do. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. That just reminded me of that. There, are, people do find Russian submarines in weird places. Well, that makes sense. That's for today. Sure. Today, Twitter is going to tell its users if right. they were um, interacting, interacting with, with a Russian bot, right, right, of the Kremlin. I'm glad they're doing something, right? You know, I mean. Okay, keep going. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. So, North Korean ghost ships. Um, so, like I said, since 2011, the Japanese Coast Guard has been 
documenting this weird occurrence that, that keeps happening. Apparently dozens of them are found along the Japanese shore uh, every year, but it, it depends a lot on the year, and we'll, we'll kind of get into that list of it in a little bit. They think that, so the, the mystery of it is, you know, what happened to these people? You know, why do they keep all these North Koreans keep dying out in the high seas, you know, in the sea of, uh, I think it's the Sea of Japan between Korea and, and, and Japan. Is it because they are like defectors from North Korea and they're like trying to get away? It, or is it just that they're like fishermen who get lost at sea? It's It's like really not entirely clear. But, you know, fishing is, like, a really dangerous enterprise. You know, if you've ever seen, like, what's what's that show they have? Like, Alaskan salmon fishermen. Shrimp. I don't know. Crazy. It's, like, really intense. P- I, I don't understand it. But apparently if you do it, you can work for, like, three months out of the year. Now, you might die. <laughs> it's not a, not a, you know, terrible chance you're going to be deceased afterwards. But your family would probably get a pretty good payout. So that's pretty cool. I don't think that's how it works in North Korea. From what I was reading, it sounds like pretty much if they're kind of like low on fishermen and like low on money and whatever, uh, Kim Jong-un just basically tells like army people, like you're going to go out and fish. But it's like these, and I I watched a video from uh, CNN, these really rickety old wooden boats that like do not look seaworthy and are not modern in any way. Like, I don't think they even have, like, power motors or anything. So this is probably part of why that's happening, right? Old boats, probably not very much food on the boats. Um, These tend to happen more in the wintertime, so apparently there's, like, seasonal winds that are blowing from North Korea to um, Japan. So just to kind of get into, the, like, the numbers, because I think that's kind of, like, the one of the weirdest parts of it is just how many of these there are. There's a lot. There are a lot. That's so, so bizarre. So, like I said, it, we only, or the Japanese Coast Guard only started keeping track in 2011. So in 2011, there were 57, and then over the next several years, there were 47, 80, 65, 34, 24 in 2016, but then 104 in 2017. So it, it just, like, went up basically, like, four and a half times from 2016 to 2017. Well. <laughs> and it's really not clear why. I mean, I guess you could say, and some people have said, like, you know, more sanctions, and they're, like, you know, kind of more cash-strapped at that point. But I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, just because I, I don't know enough about the situation. I'm not sure anyone really knows about it you know, enough about the situation. Because North Korea is just so mysterious in and of itself. Like, very few Westerners go there. We we really have very little idea of how the government works or, like, how people live. But not well. We know that. They're not, they're not, they're not living well because their government is uh, terrible. So, was the interview accurate? There wasn't an... Wait, are oh, there, the interview. Are there murals of, like, <laughs> grocery stores, but you go to it and it's, like, fake? Remember that part? I do. I do remember that part from the interview. Do you the, think that's real? Interview. Um, no, I don't think that's yeah, real. Yeah, I was going to say, that's no, what it says. I don't, I don't think so. So anyway, on these boats, um, a lot of the bodies that are found are, like, skeletal. Ew. Yeah, like, desiccated just a skeleton or sometimes like just a skull Ew. like um one of the ones that came on uh that, that came up to the shore last year um had 31 bodies including eight skeletons in one boat so and they said like like clear- dead bodies yeah like clearly they've been out there for like months and months and months too like that's the other thing is, like, some of these have been... These people have been dead for, like, six, seven months by the time they drift ashore onto the Japanese coast. And part of the reason why they know that they're from North Korea is the, like, lettering on the sides of the boats. Some of them have, like, North Korean military markings on the sides of the boats. So it's part of how they they think that, like, it's basically soldiers who are getting, like, pushed into doing this. 
which to me suggests probably a lot of these people, and again, I'm like totally extrapolating here, but probably don't know how to fish. They probably don't know how to sail. Like, they're probably just getting like pushed out there and saying like, go find the fish, but they don't know what they're doing and they don't have much food or experience or anything. So they just end up dying on the high seas and drifting over to the coast of Japan and creeping the Japanese people out (laughs) very severely. Um, They've also found some, like, North Korean cigarettes and life jackets on the ships. And um, on another one that um, drifted over on January 16th of 2018. So, like, really, really recently. Like, one of them, like, just happened. You mean four days ago? Like, four days ago. Oh, my God! Like, literally four days ago, another one washed up onto central Japan, and there were eight um, men on there, d- deceased, wearing badges uh, that had Kim Il-sung, who was the founder of the, you know, the current North Korean regime back in whatever it was, the third 40s or 50s or whatever it was, and his son Kim Jong-il, who's the father of the current leader, Kim, Kim Jong-un. Um, so basically, apparently everyone in North Korea is, has to wear these badges that, like, have the pictures of the leaders on them to show their, like, loyalty. And it's part of, like, the cult of personality, you know, around the Kims. Um, And I think it's not entirely a coincidence that Japan started keeping track of this in 2011, and Kim Jong-un also took over in 2011. So I'm not... I mean, from what I was reading, this had was happening beforehand, but I think maybe it kind of, like, accelerated it became noticeable enough that they were like we should count this exactly yeah exactly and then like i said last year there were like over a hundred of these that's not over a hundred bodies that's over a hundred boats i mean just imagine if you like say you're, you're living on like the east coast right you're like living near boston harbor and just like Every, like, couple of weeks, a, t- a couple of boats, three boats, just, like, with dead bodies keep... I mean, what? I cannot imagine, like, what the psychological impact of those Japanese people is, like, that they have to keep reliving this ex- weird experience of going out to a ghost ship. I and mean, like, if there are real ghosts, I mean, you got to imagine that that now... If there are real ghosts, I think one of the ways that they mitigate that is they, apparently, all the bodies, they, like, cremate them, they give them, like, a proper, like, Buddhist burial, because I guess that's the main religion in that, where they came drifting to, I, I guess, I don't really know. Okay. So, I think that helps to put the souls to rest. I'm not being patronizing. No, no, I'm, I'm no, really, I'm, no, no. No, sorry, you're, you're just, like, looking at me like I'm... Well, no, 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 <laughs> I, I just, you said if. And I, like, thoroughly believe that there are ghosts. No doubt about it. I know. It. That, that's why you gave me that look. Oh. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> when speaking of that, I want... At some point, I want my parents to record their ghost story. Yes. So hopefully we'll get... We'll have that in a future episode. Everybody has a ghost story. Right, exactly. So these probably were not defectors so it's like a possibility and there have been a few times where like people trying to defect um from north korea to south korea by boat have like drifted until they like got to japan because they were just like totally off right um so that has happened several times throughout the past few decades but it's pretty rare so um specifically this guy named john nielsen wright at uh, chatham house which is like a think tank in London, um, thinks that they are not defectors, just basically because it's so much easier to get to South Korea. Although, I don't know if you heard about that, oh my God, it was crazy, that North Korean defector who recently ran across the the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. Is that, is a defector like a soldier? Um, sometimes, yeah, but it doesn't have to be. It's just anyone who's leaving of one country because they feel they're getting oppressed and going to a different country that they feel is, like, going to be better for them. Okay. But when this guy was a soldier and he was actually, like, driving, you know, like a Jeep or whatever, and it broke down, and then he just had to, like, start running across the border between North and South Korea. 
and some of his fellow soldiers, North Korean soldiers, saw him and they started shooting at him. And I think he got shot like five or six times. And um, and, the, and then they airlifted him out. And uh, this, I guess, uh, army doctor did, uh, I think, what's called a thorectomy or something like that. Basically, he, because like this guy's lung had collapsed... He, he put, like, a tube, like, down, you know, to, to clear the, the airway, and apparently that's what saved his life. Oh, he survived? He survived. And they had to do, like, so many surgeries on him, and not only had he gotten shot, but he was riddled with parasites. Ew! Like, so many. That's so gross. I know. I, I, I can't. Imagine being that nurse. I know, right? Ew. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently this is something that they think happens because they use uh, human feces as fertilizer. Ew. Okay, so do they do autopsies on these bodies and figure out cause of death or...? They do on the ones that they can. So a lot of them, like I said, are like skeletal by the time they get there. So obviously they can't really do an autopsy, you know, when they're so decomposed but they, they have done autopsies i think on some of them but it's really not conclusive like they assume that they died from exposure or from starvation but really no one knows exactly how they died or or why this keeps happening but um like i said it's, it's probably just that they're like being sent out there to you know whatever fish and they end up just because the North Korean regime, like, d- doesn't care that much, right? Um, apparently. And that's what it seems like, anyway. So, one other thing I wanted to mention, though, like, for these Jap- from the perspective of these Japanese people, so in the 70s and 80s, apparently the North Korean government did send over spies on boats, and they abducted at least 17 Japanese citizens. <gasps> Primarily, they said, to train... North Korean spies? I'm not exactly sure what that means. Like, train them to speak Japanese, or, like, I don't really know. I don't really know. But that has happened before. That's weird. So that's something else that, like, the Japanese people are kind of, like, freaked out by. Like, you know, because um, there have been ones that showed up with people who were completely alive, too. That's rarer. But some of these, you know, ships that drift over aren't ghost ships because they actually have live people. So, so what do those people say? They don't say much. They don't. Are they not allowed to? Probably. Like oh, they yeah. don't. Oh, oh definitely. Oh my god. And, and and some of them end up getting sent back to North Korea because they basically like, you know, they didn't mean to defect or anything. They just went the wrong way and ended up in Japan instead of back home. I guess. <laughs> Oh my god. So it's it's very mysterious. So what do you think happened? What's I mean, your theory? Right, 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 right. I mean, basically what I said, that, you know, these are people who were pushed into trying to find fish and going out into the sea who... I mean, shit, if, if somebody put me on a boat right now and told me to go find some fish for the deer leader... I wouldn't have any idea what I'm doing. I've never, I've barely been on a boat before. (laughs) So I feel like that's what's happening. It's just like the combination of inexperience and the bad weather and the harsh conditions and the little food is just this recurring, you know, issue that they keep sending these people out and they keep dying and they keep ending up on the coast of Japan freaking people out. So it's not like these like, rogue um, North Korean soldiers who were, like, caught. And so they just send them on this ship and send them off with no supplies, no food. And it that's their, that like, punishment. I mean, it definitely could be that, too. Because that's, that's, that's what I was thinking. That's I don't think that's... Um, yeah, I think that's plausible. But there's so many, though. That's the there thing. Are, there are. But, you know, I think we've also recently found out that North Korea basically has, like gulags, you know, like concentration camp type prisons for their own people. So I I don't think anything is beyond this, you know, rogue regime up in the northern peninsula of Korea. So it definitely could be intentional. And of course, you know, the the North Korean regime is not saying anything. So 
Yeah. Weird stuff. Um, my sources. Okay. So I got a lot of stuff from um, Wikipedia, of course, from the, the North Korean ghost ship Wikipedia page. Good bless. Right. Um, best thing that ever happened to the internet. Um, also from an article on Snopes.com by Kim LaCapria. Um, from CNN, uh, Junko Agura at CNN. Uh, Julian Ryle at The Telegraph. Jake Adelstein at The Daily Beast. Tim Hume at Vice News. And Samuel Osborne of The Independent. Yeah, doing their jobs, finding shit out so we can talk about it. Thank you, people. Oh, my God. So that was mine. Yay. Yeah. Um, you have so, you have way more sources than I do, as always. I just, like, do a lot of reading in one spot. Because mm-hmm. a million tabs at once stresses me out. Okay. Right. So you ready for this? I am ready. Aye, aye, Captain. I can't hear you. SpongeBob SquarePants! Okay, all right. It's just kind of funny, because... The one that I'm talking about is called The Lost Dutchman's Gold Mind. And if you recall, there is a character on Spongebob called, uh, oh, he's, he's like called the Dutchman. He's like a ghost. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've seen that. Oh, man. What's his name? It's like the something Dutchman or the Dutchman. The Flying something. Dutchman? The Flying Dutchman. That's what it is. Well, because the Flying Dutchman is a famous ghost ship. Oh. Maybe that's one we can talk about in the future. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Yay. If you listen to Stuff You Missed in History Class, which is one of my favorite podcasts, uh, they talk a lot about ghost ships. That's like one of their favorite topics is like shipwrecks and ghost ships. And anyway, that's a good one. Okay. So the first thing I noticed when like doing all this research is the amount of stories and lore behind this this legend. Okay. Um, so it is located in, get this, the Superstition Mountains in central Arizona. What is? The Dutchman Gold Mine. Oh, okay. The legend of the Dutchman Sorry, Gold we, we, Mine. We, we got off on the other thing, so I didn't catch that. Uh, okay, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a mysterious treasure that may or may not exist. And so, like, you know, anthropologists, treasure hunters, prospectors, conspiracy theorists. Um, hikers, all these type of people all over the USA have tried to find it. Mm. And um, they all, not all, but uh, a striking amount of them end up dead or simply disappear. It's quite bizarre. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like I said, because it's like such a legendary thing, there's a ton and ton of different stories and theories. And some of them seem way more believable than the others. And some of it I like only found that in one place and no other place said anything about that but yeah um okay so what I did was gather the ones that I liked my favorite ones and also the ones that are the most interesting and the ones that seem the most believable and those are the ones I'll talk the ones I'll talk about then I'll talk about some of the people who who disappeared or died because those are crazy cute so no one really knows the exact number of people who lost their lives or simply went missing in the mountains, but some say it's upwards of 600. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't know about 600, but there were definitely a lot, a lot of different cases that I read, and 20 plus of them are, like, proven deaths. Um, like, they found remains and stuff. Um, lots of beheadings, which we'll talk about later. Not only were there tons of different cases there were tons of different origin stories as to how the gold mine came to be and why it's so dangerous and mysterious so here's some origin stories that i found the pima indians are one of many local native american tribes who inhabit the area it's said that the superstition mountains get their name from an evil spirit that guards the treasure and he only sleeps four hours a day so the idea is to get in and get out while the evil spirit is sleeping i found that at one place and i just thought it was interesting yeah I think that one's the least plausible. Okay, another one is that the mountain itself is cursed, which I I believe. And Native Americans believe that the entrance to the underworld was, was held within the mountains. And then in the 1860s, there's a lot about this guy too. A German man named Jacob Waltz, who they called the Dutchman, mm. came to America in hope to find gold. He's also someone who could have originated, like, this whole story. 
So in this case, Waltz did in fact find a vein of gold, but he later grew very ill and he gave the list of clues to his caregiver, a woman named Julia Thomas. She and others went searching for the treasure, but they were unsuccessful. They never found anything. And so they sold the map for $7, which um, in the 1860s, it was under, it's a little under $200 in today's money. So there are many versions of this, this story too. Um, sometimes it's told with both Jacob Waltz and another man named Jacob Weiser. And in most versions, um, the two men or, or one, like however it's told, um, find the gold and Weiser is attacked by either Native Americans or jealous Waltz. But he survives long enough to tell a man named Dr. Walker about the mine. And there is evidence of a real historical Jacob Waltz, who was a miner slash prospector in about 1848. And he has a grave in the Pioneer and Military Cemetery west of downtown Phoenix. And uh, it's sometimes said that he wasn't very lucky when it came to mining, but others say that he periodically would show up with like amounts of gold. So there's kind of like a, a fluctuation in between that. Hmm. The, the next one is the Dr. Thorne slash Apache gold theory uh, or story. It is said that the members of the Apache tribe had a gold mine in the mountains, but once a man named Miguel Peralta and his family discovered it and they started to mine it, but they were attacked or massacred by the Apaches in 1850. Um, this, what, this is what was called the Peralta Massacre. And there was a lot, that was the whole story in and of itself, and I didn't really get into it because it was basically from, stemmed from this basic story, was that they were attacked because they were um, mining gold that they didn't know wasn't theirs. Sure. So years later, a man called Dr. Thorne heals a wounded Apache member. Um, some people say it was the chief. And he was rewarded with the treasure. The tribe blindfolded him, took him to the mountains, where he was allowed to take as much gold as he, as he could carry. And Dr. Thorne was either unwilling or able to re relocate the mine when they, like, asked him. And uh, it's not entirely clear if he, like, came back rich or if he was, a, like, alive. It was just, it's all very mysterious. Right. Um, and the next one uh, is two U.S. Army soldiers find gold in the Superstition Mountains. They allegedly presented some of the gold, but they had vanished or were killed soon after. So I just thought that was, was um, interesting because it was connected to soldiers. So, um, like I said, there's lots of deaths. And I have some of those that I'm going to read. There's four. Four. I picked four out of the, like, 30 plus that I could do. Yeah, it was crazy. These are like the most interesting or you said like the most kind of plausible. Yeah. Because it I, sounds like everything about this almost is like in flux, you know, which totally makes sense to me because the Western United States of the mid to late 19th century, not a great place for record keeping. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of uh, good governance going on at that time, <laughs> per se. So, Okay. The first one, Jesse Capen, he was a 35-year-old man who was obsessed with finding this treasure. And it was in 2009 that he went missing. In 2009? Yeah. In his apartment, they found, like, books and maps and hundreds of articles about the Superstition Mountains and all, and, like, the trails and, like, where the gold could be and all this stuff. Mm. And, according, like, they found this, and it... Apparently, he had tried to find it two other times before, but he didn't, he didn't tell anyone about it, which is mm. both stupid and greedy. Like, right. You know, if you're going to go find gold, you're not going to be like, BRB, I right. might be rich. Yeah. Um, Don't follow me. It'll turn into a national treasure, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think Nicholas or, Cage... Or that show that my dad likes to watch about, like, some mysterious... Tra what is it? Oak Island. The Oak Island. Mystery of Oak Island. Oh, my God. One more person has to die before they can find it. Oh. It's on, like, TLC. I later. have seen an episode of that. Okay, anyway. Yeah. Um, choo -choo -choo. yeah, so he went off two times before. And without telling one about it, the Superstition Search and Rescue Team, which exists, 
which had been searching for Capon every weekend for three years, found his remains after, after three years. They said it was in a tight spot, 30 feet off the ground, and his official, his official cause of death remains unknown. So they don't think that he fell? Well, they don't. They think he might have fell into the crevice. That's or what I was thinking. He, um, or his um, remains were um, moved there somehow by just weather and Maybe erosion. Maybe a, a puma or something. And st- yeah, animals. So the next one is, um, this is the most famous, and this is the one that I think really, well, I mean, it, yeah, it really got the ball rolling for this, these stories and this, like, lost Dutchman's mind thing to get, mm-hmm. to get going. So Dr. Adolf Ruth is his name. The death of Dr. Ruth was back in 1932, and uh, it, it's what made the mountains famous. His death is the most well-known because it's kind of the creepiest. He set out on a two-week journey into the mountains back in June of 1931, and when he never came back, a rescue team went out to search for him, but they didn't, they didn't find any remains. But later in the year, um, uh, hikers uh, it found a skull. And then it was positively identified as Ruth's. Um, but here's the thing. His skull had two bullet holes in it. And the anthropologist slash doctor who looked at it, he said a lot of stuff about it. But he, the main thing he said was that it was either a shotgun or a high-powered rifle because... At, like the entrance point was a small hole and the exit point was enormous. Right. So the rest of his remains were also found, including his own pistol, and it was still full of bullets. Like there weren't any, there weren't any missing. Hmm. Um, and I didn't understand. Maybe you can explain this to me. There were also metal pins found that were used to mend his broken bones. Is that a thing? Yeah, definitely. I, I didn't know that they started that practice all the way back then, but. Yeah, when there is a really severe break, sometimes it'll be necessary to put, like, a metal pin in the juncture between two bones to to shore up that area, you know, basically to become a surrogate bone, in a sense. And that's something that still happens up to today, yeah. Okay. Um, they found those. Um, but his map was gone. Ooh. Ooh. And it sounds like he was, like, way late or something. I mean, if he didn't have a chance to shoot back. I know, right? You know, it sounds like he was, like, uh, come upon, you know, in the dead of night or something. That's what I would prefer to. That's the scariest, most interesting thing to me. But wait, there's more. Okay. Even creepier, they also found his checkbook with detailed instructions as to where to find the mine. He ended the note with the Latin phrase... Veni vidi vici. I say right. my co- I I came. I saw. I conquered. Right. Isn't that weird? That is that is strange. Okay. So next, we have James A. Cravey. He back in the this was a little later a little later. So back in the forties, um, he is a sixty two year old treasure hunter, and he went in search of the gold. And there was a lot of there was a lot of hype about the treasure during this specific time because it was like. Um, what is it now? About eight plus years after Adolf Ruth, the doctor, died. Um, so he landed in the desert via helicopter and he began his 10 day trip. And of course, um, when the pilot landed, uh, he, when he came back 10 days later, Cravey was nowhere to be seen. His camp was left intact and two days worth of food was missing. Even creepier, they found his decapitated body in the wilderness of the mountains. And it wasn't until six months later that they found his skull. No one knows why he was beheaded or who killed him. So he was beheaded too? Yes. Yes. Interesting. From 1955 to 1977, five people were found dead with bullet holes in their heads. Yeah. Two, two more bodies were found also without out heads, but their skulls were never recovered. So, like I said, it's it's weird because there's a lot of beheadings. It's not like they just find these, like, skeleton people who could have, oh, they probably died of, you know, exposure, starvation, got lost. But it's, like, clear stuff that they were, like, attacked by something. Shot in the head and then also decapitated. <laughs> but also, like, many years apart. Right? So, I mean, you would think, okay, maybe there's some psychotic 
person living out in the woods in that area or something, right? But mm-hmm. it seems kind of unlikely that they would have been doing this, like, for 30 years, you know, continuously. It's crazy. Um, the next one, I think this is my last one. Yeah. Yes, my last one. Uh, James Kidd. James Kidd vanished December 29th, 1949. He wasn't just another man to vanish into the mountains. This guy's really interesting. He had a very odd life. He didn't have any friends or family, and few people knew anything, really anything about him. Um, and his disappearance didn't really wasn't that important um, until 25 years later when it was discovered that he left behind half a million dollars in fortune. So remember, this is 1949. So right. that's a lot, a lot of money. Right. Um, and what they say is that he made his money by investing in the stock market. The stock market, but the source to those investments is a total mystery. And he he was a prospector, and he did a lot of mining on his own. So it's sometimes believed that he had like a stash of gold somewhere, and that like he took it when he needed it and used that to invest and stuff like that. And there's a, also a t- like I could go on about this guy. There's also a ton of weird stuff about him. Like there's lots of different theories and stories. But most being that he was murdered for his fortune and it was never it was never found. Um, but what was most noticeable noticeable about his interest was his interest in the supernatural. His will stated that the fortune can go to anyone who proves that visual ghosts exist. And his remains have never been found. I feel like that's gonna be your will. Okay. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> no. Um, but I also read more about him. I didn't write this down because it was a lot, but the lost Dutchman goldmine.com, I got his story from. And the author, I don't think, I don't think his name was ever up there, but he was talking about how he had these like sources of people who knew this guy. Mm. And, um, uh, like their stories have died with them, and right. so some. There was one. There was one that said like, James Kidd was like dying of cancer, and so he, um, he asked his friend to, um, like drop him off in the mountains and like let him stay out there and like to come back and check on him every couple of weeks, and he was getting worse and worse every couple of weeks. So this guy was like, "You need, you need to come back," and he like refused. Um, and then one day. They, like, found him dead. Mm. Um, but he wanted to keep his death a secret and his fortune a secret. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. So it's been, like, covered by all this, but I don't know about that. Yeah. I know about that. Um, so, yeah, Wikipedia. And Ranker has, like, this whole graveyard shift area of their, like, website. Ranker is a great It's website. amazing. Yeah. And the article was written by Lyra Radford. And like I said, the lost Dutchman gold mine dot yeah. com. So it seems like it's cursed for sure. Something. Something weird is going on. Do you think there's actually gold? I mean, I think if there if there were gold at one point, it's probably not there anymore. People it says people have found it, but they've disappeared. Right. Yeah. Like Something like something happened to that. To it them. seems like a lot of very similar deaths to just be a coincidence. I mean, if you're really looking at it from a rational scientific point of yep. view, you know, it's at some point coincidence becomes not coincidence mm-hmm. and becomes evidence of something else that's, that's going. Points. Oh, it's and so it's, weird. You know, like we don't we don't know what else is going on, but. It seems like there's something else going on. Ooh. Something creepy. <laughs> it's, um... It's... Which one? One of them, like, ran... Oh, oh, um... Who was it that helped out the Apache? Dr. Thorne, who helped out the Apache member. Um, it also said that it was Geronimo. Mm-hmm. That was, like, the person that he helped out. Right. But, yeah. That's all I got. Very nice. You can read about, you can read and read and read about this if y'all want to keep going. There is a um, book about James Kidd called, I think it's called The Soul Truth or The Soulful Truth. And it's what came out of his, um, his fortune. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go team. Nice. Break.
<laughs> now we'll talk about some weird shit in the news. Yeah, so Mario and I looked at this and we cannot not address I'm this, sure y'all, this shit. Yeah, I'm sure I'm, y'all have got, seen this. You story. guys have heard of it, of for sure. So this is, of course, like the the biggest story in the news right now, right? Yeah. It's the the Turpin children. So yes, David, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about those the thirteen children who were found in a home shackled to furniture, malnourished, abused. Right. So yeah, David Turpin and Louise Turpin apparently had been keeping their children in you know, basically captivity for, I don't think we even know how long. They said that they moved into the house in 2014. But the, it, clearly this had been going on before. Oh, that. for sure. I mean, and they said, you know, that they thought they were all children, but even, like, the oldest son was, I think it was a son, was 29. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, some of the other ones were close to that age. They thought they were, like, 15, or like 12. Yeah. Like they were so, it breaks my heart. They were so emaciated and so, and uh, I remember there was one story where a neighbor had seen some of the older ones putting Christmas tree lights uh, up and, you know, just being a neighbor just came up, you know, and said, hi, you know, how are y'all doing? And they just froze and they would not talk to them. They were just like looking down and like, mm, we're not supposed to talk to people and uh, the neighbors eventually just walked away. But that was one of the very few instances that I read about where, like, anything was actually noticeable, which is the other really weird thing about this. Like, their backdoor neighbor said he never saw anything. He didn't even know they had kids. <gasps> what? Yeah. And there were 13, a total of 15 people living in this house, the parents and the 13 kids. I saw the interview with the sister of... Um, right. The, the mother. Right. And she was all like, oh, I pray for their salvation, this, this, and that. She was crying and she was talking about how they, for 20 years, they had been trying to get in contact with her and they couldn't, they never right. could. Yeah. And then they, and then this happens. Right. I also saw some really strange pictures. So apparently the couple. I was trying to look for pictures. So appa- apparently David and Louise have. Re, um, redone their vows like three times or something, including in 2015. Mm-hmm. And all the kids were there. They went to Las Vegas. Oh yeah, I saw I saw a picture. Right, all, all the kids' faces. Yeah, are their faces out. are blurred up. They're all wearing pink. Yeah, and and they said that like on Facebook, like they posted stuff. It was all about their religious stuff, and they looked like a happy family. Yeah, not so much. Kids were being, like, shackled to a bed and starved and whatever else. You know, I don't think we even know the half of it probably at this point. But um, that just seems so weird to me, like, that dissonance between their public persona and then, like, what was really going on. And they're saying, they're talking about sexual abuse, too. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, I, I would not doubt that. Um, I think it's one of the cousins or sisters of the dad said that um, he used to, like, watch her in the shower. Ew. When they were younger. Yeah, Ew. so I've, I've heard a little bit about, you know, kind of a history of that sort of stuff with these people. Um, there was an interview. I didn't watch it. Um, there was an interview with the Elvis impersonator who's there at Vegas. Oh, really? Yeah, like, wow. during their vows, uh-huh. and, uh, like, he was, like, talking to the kids and stuff. I didn't watch the video. I should have. Because I didn't really understand why there was an Elvis impersonator, and then I, like, read the story later about how the vows and stuff. That's why I didn't click on it at the time. Mm-hmm. But, but how it actually came out was pretty interesting, too. Like, the 17-year-old daughter, I guess, found, like, an old phone that was totally deactivated. Yes. And she ran out of the house, and... She the, escaped through a window. Th- oh, through a window. That's right. Um, and a good thing to know, like, this is actually, like, a pretty good piece of information. Even if a phone is, is completely without service, Mm -hmm. you can call 911. Yeah. 911 will always work, as long as it's got charge. Um, so she called 911, and they were rescued, and, um, I guess they said when they came into the house, the mom was, like, confused as to why the police were Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Which is also very weird and creepy. Maybe they just, like, are so deep in there psychologically that they think this is normal or something. Also, 
Who knows? Man, they are ugly. Oh my god, the dad, the fuck? He is so gross looking. Oh my god. He's very weird. He's got like a like a bowl He's got haircut. like a bowl cut. Ew, he was oh, uh, uh, like, he, he was lo- so he gross. He looks like like that weird child that you'd see in a playground, <laughs> but a but a adult. <laughs> like it is kind of I mean, if it weren't so crazy and tragic, it would be funny, right? Like yeah. he looks like a SNL character or something. He's gross. I don't understand. So here's here's what happened. Um they ended up being tried for twelve counts of torture, seven counts of abuse of a dependent adult, because um seven of them were adults over the age of eighteen. Right. Um Six counts of child abuse or neglect, 12 counts of false imprisonment, and they said the dad could possibly be um, accused with, it was something that had to do with sexual abuse, and they didn't know. But they're on sure. like, they're on like a $9 billion bond or something. Yeah, they're not, they're, uh, they're never gonna get out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that that's what I, I was reading somewhere, that they're probably gonna face life imprisonment charges. And I would imagine they'll plead no contest or guilty because, I mean, there's no way they didn't do this. Like, clearly, <laughs> we, 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 the police went into the house and saw it happening. So, that was de- definitely the weirdest thing in the news right now. I can't wait for the documentary. Oh, there will definitely be a documentary. In 10 years. And there will definitely be a Lifetime movie. And, I yeah. I imagine. Yeah. That's what I, I just... Those kids, I just want to, I, I just want to see their recovery, and I want to see them be okay. Like that's you know what? what I bet they're going to be fine. I the, think the I human think spirit fine, and like especially children, you know, are able to just like overcome so One much. One of them was two. I know a little baby. I know the whole thing breaks my heart. Oh my god! But you know, I I really believe like that they're going to be okay. Yeah, and like their parents are going to find you know they're going to be held to account and. You know, I, and it seems like they have a nice family. They have relatives who care for them. That's what it seemed like. That's what it seemed like. But, I mean, you never really know, I guess. No, but I hope so. I mean, it, it, you're right. It seemed like the rest of the family was not as crazy as they were, <laughs> for yeah. sure. So, yeah, weird. Weird shit. Sad. Weird, sad, sad shit. Anywho. Yeah, well, that's uh, another uh, MMT in the can. I'm I'm just going to steal sign-off lines from all the other podcasts I listen to. So that's going to be... I don't want to do that. We have to make up our own. Okay, but for now I'm going to say... Good job by you, Chloe! Oh my god. (laughs) Maybe... (laughs) Ew! (laughs) That's stolen from Cousin Sal on the the BS podcast, Bill Simmons. Yeah. Great. Um, Stay sexy, don't get murdered? That's not ours. (laughs) I love them. We're going to go see them sometime. I hope so. Karen and Georgia, my favorite murder. We're going to go see them. The bestest podcast. The bestest. Yeah. Bestest. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Um, Yeah, subscribe. Please do subscribe to us on iTunes. Leave us a rating. Uh, We're going to be up on Patreon soon, so be looking out for that. And yeah. Bye. Bye.